Good evening, and it's lovely to see you all back here. Um, we have struggled sometimes during the um, epidemic, pandemic, to communicate with you all, but we've got there. And now we have another struggle in that the Baptist Church has installed all sorts of new equipment, um, which uh, our team of uh, gentlemen at the back have uh, mastered, we hope. Um, and I would like to thank the Baptist Church for having us back. Um, they've been very generous with their um, space and time, and um, particularly to Nick from the Baptist Church, who has been holding our hands. <laughs> um, I'd also like to thank all of you for your support. You have been very loyal and patient and supported us throughout the last 18 months. Um, there have been times when St. Barb has, um, life has been a bit tricky, um, money's been short, um, but we are now very pleased to have funding from the Arts Council and from all our local authorities around here who have put their faith in us, and I think that is very generous of them and very reassuring for St. Barb that we have a future. Um, we have now got a full programme of events through the rest of this year. Um, our next talk um, will be an introduction to the new exhibition. So our lovely curator, Steve Marshall, will be here. And the exhibition is um, it's called Unsettling Landscapes, Art of the Eerie. And um, it's a look at rural landscapes um, through World War I, World War II, and um, there are some fairly eerie looking pictures, but Steve and his co-curator Jill will be talking to us on the 1st of October. And then on the 5th of November, we have something a little bit different. We have Philip St. Lawrence, who is an inspirational speaker, coming to talk to us about Sir Francis Drake as a leader, um, which is uh, going to be interesting. Um, and I think for the moment, that is all, except to know if anybody took part in our sunflower growing competition. <laughs> and did you beat Jackie's three meters 25? <laughs> no? I have a medal for you, Jackie. We also have to thank her for sponsoring the competition, I have to say. <laughs> right, now to this evening's speaker, Emma Page. Um, she's going to talk to us about the Exbury Estate and how it was put together. Um, she lives currently in what was part of the Exbury Estate originally, Leap House, and that's where her interest started, and she's done a postgraduate degree um, looking, researching um, the Exbury estate. She's also written a book, yes. which we have for sale, and it'll be at sale at the front desk um, as on your way out, cash or cards. We now have the ability to take cards, more technology. So, Emma, welcome to the Friends of St. Barb. Um, Nice turnout for you. And just to let you know that we will be, from now on, um, recording these talks and putting them on our St. Barb YouTube channel so that if any, you know anybody who isn't able to be here tonight, um, they will be from next week, um, hopefully Monday, be able to watch the talk online. Okay. So we're moving forward. Right, Emma, over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you all very much for turning out on a Friday evening. Um, I've been asked to talk about the Mitfords at Exbury, and this um, does stem from the research I did for my Masters and then for my DPhil at Oxford University. And some people ask me, why was I doing a Masters in History? Well, I started life actually at Oxford as a studying chemistry. 
And I then went on to be an accountant for 35 years. And then when I retired, I thought, I must carry on doing something. And I found you can't go back into chemistry after 35 years. And I didn't want to do any more accountancy. I thought there must be more to life than that. So I thought, well, what else could I do? And I was actually working in India at the time. And I found that the, uh, I could do an online uh, undergraduate diploma at Oxford University in history. So I thought, right, history will do. There's really no more subtle than that. And as I'm both an accountant and a chemist, I found that what you're doing is an experimenting. You're finding out what the answer is to things. You, uh, there is an answer. When I started doing history, I realized that was not the case. There's never an answer. And the question is always, why does something happen, not what has happened? And I also find that in order to do um, a research degree, you either have to start off with a burning question, and I didn't really have one of those because I'd only just taken history because it seemed available, um, or you need a source. And if you have a source, then you can try and conjure up a research question to ask. So I was slightly stumped when I had to come up with my research question for my master's. And then I heard Nick de Rothschild talking um, at the um, Bully Estate dinner, actually, about the Exbury Estate book, which he had safely locked away in the fireproof safe at the Exbury Estate office. And I thought, well, that'll do. So I <laughs> persuaded my uh, supervisor that I would write about this Exbury Estate book, and I then went to see it, and I got a bit of a shock. So, the Mitfords. Um, the Mitfords have been based up in Northumberland, at Mitford, since the Norman Conquest. And they owned the Mitford estate there up until 1993. But in this talk, I'm going to trace the cadet branch, the younger branch of the Mitfords, and see how and why they moved from Mitford, Northumberland, to Exbury and Hampshire. My talk covers a period from 1711 in the reign of Queen Anne to after 1785, that's the French Revolution. So as an, an earlier non-historian, those are the kind of sort of key um, endpoints that I could relate to. I'll explain how the junior branch of the Mitford family became landed gentry in their own right and speculate on why they wanted to do this. Thank you. Um, this is the arms they finally become, became entitled to uh, with Mitford of Exbury uh, at the bottom. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the location of Exbury. Um, you can see there I put on the map, Exbury is, was originally on the coast, just to the west of Leap, at the mouth of the Bewley River, and Lymington is a little bit further west along the coast. So Exbury is now famous for Exbury Gardens, um, but then that didn't exist, and the Exbury House didn't exist. This is the complete map of Hampshire, dated 1645 by J. Blow. And you'll notice from this, if you can see it well enough, that the area around the Bewley River is less populated than the rest of Hampshire. So in the centre of Hampshire, there's quite a lot of villages, quite a lot of density. But down by um, Bewley, there's very little. And the reason for that is that at that stage, in the 17th and 18th century, there were very few roads across the New Forest. I mean, it was sort of um, highwayman and smuggler territory, not, not roads. And so most of the transport was by sea. And so there were ships that plied a trade along from Plymouth, Lymington, to Portsmouth. And in fact, when I um, did my defill, my supervisor tried to persuade me that the area I should be looking at, which I chose as the New Forest and the Isle of Wight, should contain Southampton. And I had a lot of difficulty persuading him that the, the, the Solent was actually the road between the New Forest and the Isle of Wight. It was easy to cross backwards and forwards across the Solent. Getting to Southampton was extremely difficult. 
Getting to Portsmouth, that was fine, but I had to, to stick to a narrow area for my defill. So the coastal settlements were linked by either the bigger ships you can see on this map or by little coastal hoys. I've got a photograph later. As I said at the beginning, I started with the source rather than my research question. And the book that uh, Nick de Rothschild had in his state safe was called Book B. You can see the B on that uh, book cover. And it's about that tall and about that wide. I don't know what that is, folio or bigger. Um, and at that point, the location of books A, C, and D, which were referred to in book B, was unknown. And so I completed my master's, completed my DPhil, um, wrote, wrote this book, edited this book. Um, and then embarrassingly, when my uncle died, we were living at Leap House, I cleared out one of the cupboards <laughs> full of account books and sort of, you know, racy novels and things. And there were books A, C, and D, <laughs> which are much smaller and unfortunately not, not, didn't have as much information. And so I immediately um, donated them to the New Forest Heritage Centre for them to look after, and they have actually transcribed them. Uh, well, not transcribed them, they've digitised them. There are four main authors of this estate book. Uh, the main instigator was William Mitford, who was a Baltic merchant, and that meant that he traded timber between the city of London and Scandinavia. Um, his father was also uh, a merchant. And in fact, it was typical in those days, or the, the 17th, 18th century, for the younger son of a landed gentry family uh, either to go into the church, and then the next one would become a merchant, and then it, you know, it went on down. Um, so the fact that this junior branch of the Mitford family were merchants was, was um, very, very normal. They were sent out to, to make their money. And uh, he married well, uh, somebody called Mary Edwards, who was the daughter of another London merchant, City of London merchant. Um, and these were, when I say merchants, these were guild, you know, City of London guild merchants. Um, the next generation, Jackie, John, was, uh, became a lawyer and therefore earned more money, more money than accountants. Um, and his son, uh, one of them, the junior one, again, the second son, was a lawyer, except um, he became Speaker of the House of Commons and uh, Lord Chancellor of Ireland. So, you know, you can see the progression over the generations getting progressively richer and richer. And the older one, uh, Colonel Mitford, who is three times great-grandfather to Nancy Mitford, and I'm afraid that's my only mention of those Mitford daughters. So, I committed to using the source, and then I went to have a look at it and take some photographs, and this is what I found. Um, it was basically a working document, and the four generations of Mitfords, or four Mitford uh, men, had written in it, and their diff differing agents had written in it, and they all had different uh, ways of writing. And they just crossed things out and wrote over it in a different ink. And some of those inks faded better than others, or worse than others. And so, um, you know, it was really pretty, pretty tricky. There were some good bits, uh, a few maps, um, and at the back there was a list of all the areas that, uh, with names of fields, but unfortunately, no map to go with that. So when I came to create my own maps, I had to look at the descriptions and the acreages and then modern maps and try and work out where actually these parcels of land were. But it seemed to me that it would be a really interesting uh, source for local historians and for family historians and indeed for schools because there's a, there's a lot about day-to-day -day life in this book. Um, so, at the end of my master's, they, when you have your sort of viva, they all say, and so what are you going to do with this? And, you, and I said, oh, I'm going to um, transcribe it and publish it as part of a record series. And they said, oh, very good, yes, well, let me know when you've done that. And I thought, oh. <laughs> so that's what I did. And um, this is it. So it's got a brief introduction, but actually most of it is a transcription with all the crossings out and the spelling mistakes and more different spellings. Um, 
and uh, selling it. £15 goes to the New Forest Heritage Centre and £5 to St Barb's, so I do hope you'll feel charitable this evening. So my first question was, my first research question was, why? Um, why would William Mitford, uh, a London merchant, want a country estate? I mean, it's a long way from London and not very easy to get to. As I said, there are no roads. Was it because he wanted to move into the gentry? And that's certainly what Daniel Defoe thought. He thought the rising tradesman swells into the gentry, and he also added that the gentry fade into the tradesman. Um, and Adam Smith, later on in the 18th century, said that, rather disparagingly, that merchants are commonly ambitious of becoming country gentlemen. Um, and these two book plates and the coat of arms um, do suggest that that is indeed what the Mitfords wanted. They started as a cadet branch of the Mitfords of Mitford, and they wanted to be the Mitfords of somewhere else. So, um, an alternative explanation, which some people have put forward for, for merchants generally, is that they wanted to make money. They wanted to be agrarian capitalists. Um, but I'll show later that, uh, that if that was what William thought he was going to do, he was sadly mistaken. My next question is, why Hampshire? Um, this chart, I don't know if you can see it well, is the, shows the number of land purchases by merchants in the 18th century. And as you'll see, by far the greatest number are in counties which are close to London. So in fact, these people didn't want a country estate. They wanted a country house they could sort of nip out to for the weekend, you know, go visit and then go back home to carry on their life in the city. Quite difficult to do that at Exbury um, in the 18th century. However, and you can see the Hampshire is the red line really low down in that, in that list. So, um, as part of his marriage settlement um, in 1718, he um, agreed with his father-in-law that he would buy something in the country. Maybe they were aspiring to be uh, country gentlemen. Um, and the first thing he bought was Newtown, and I'm sure many of you knew New Newtown because it's, it's very close to Lymington. And he paid £3,230 for that, including £39 for a stack of hay and a pew in the church, Boulder Church. Um, I think it's interesting that he bought a, a pew, presumably that's so he could sit at the front and look like he was, you know, important, and he'd arrived. Um, but anyway, but why Newtown? Um, well, first, um, it was being sold by um, a Barbados merchant, and we all know about the West Indies now and slavery and things like that, but actually it, Practically everybody was linked to the slave trade or the West Indies at that, uh, at that stage. So it's not surprising that his family knew somebody um, who was a Barbados merchant, and probably when the guy wanted to sell, there weren't estate agents in those days, so you, you, know, you put out feelers and could find somebody who wanted to buy. Um, more, uh, the other thing was it was cheap. It was affordable. But there were two reasons, at least two reasons for that. It uh, was based on land which a, a modern-day agricultural scholar has described as land in which the, only the most hopelessly optimistic saw any possible agricultural potential. And that's true of all the strip along the, the south coast between Lymington and Southampton. And the second problem, why it was cheap, was that there was absolutely no potential for it ever to be a landed estate. Um, it was no good, therefore, for making money from farming, and it could, couldn't be a landed estate because at least a, a third of the money was for the house itself. And a landed estate, you basically got to be buying the land, not a country house. A country estate is not a country house with a garden. Um, and the other par uh, par parcels of land, 
um, as you can see, they, they weren't contiguous. And in fact, one of them was on the Isle of Wight. So that's not really, you know, it doesn't sound like a landed estate, does it, if you have sort of a whole day-long journey to get your, to your little farm on the south bit of the Isle of Wight. The other big problem was that actually the freehold was owned by Lord Arundel, and he was Lord of the Manor. So William Mitford was never going to be the freeholder or Lord of the Manor, and Lord Arundel was not going to sell. So that was a problem. So why Exbury? Well, what happened a lot in the 17th and 18th centuries is the male line of families died out. And one solution was often for the daughter to marry somebody else, and then that man would change his name. And that happened at the Compton family quite a bit, but eventually it gave out. Um, and so they started to sell off their outlying bits of estate, and Exbury was one of those. Um, and that was a freehold manor, um, so that's what um, William Mitford was able to buy. And in the bishop's visitation for Exbury in 1725, um, what they said was, we have no nobleman, gentleman, etc., but one William Mitford, lord of our manor. So at last, by 1725, he'd sort of arrived. And you can imagine him standing over the, uh, the shoulder of the rector who was replying to the bishop's questionnaire, saying, write down lord of the manor. Um, and indeed he was. So this is what the Exbury estate looked like when the Mitfords sold it in uh, the end of the 19th century to, to my family. Um, but it took them a long time to get there. A lot of people think that they bought an estate, the Exbury estate, but they didn't. Why? Well, the Mitfords had three problems. The first one was finding a willing seller with legal title. The second was getting what they paid for. And the third thing was finding the money to buy something. So finding a willing seller was a, prob was a problem for three more reasons. The first was that uh, there were very few proper farms, you know, consolidated plots of land. And in 1718, William Mitford bought Exbury, uh, that's in the sort of beigey colour, and Gatewood in the pink. Um, he paid £4,000 for these farms, but another £1,750 for the standing timber on the estate, on, the, on these two areas, and £60 for the rights to the river and the, and the wharfage. He also later bought Stone Farm, but then sold it to uh, the Drummonds at Cadland. So, as you can see from that map, he's only got a very small part of the Exbury estate. He next had to buy individual fields. And these were separate bargains, and they all referred to things like Ozes and uh, Whitwoods. But worse than that, he then had to buy individual strips. And you may have heard of strip farming, which a lot of people sort of thought died out in medieval times, but it was still going strong in this part of the world in the 18th, early 18th century. As you can probably imagine, finding out who owned which strip was a complete nightmare. Um, and one of the problems was that some of the strips, again, were not owned freehold, but they were leasehold. And the way they were owned mostly in those days was by copyhold. And copyhold, instead of getting a title deed, you get a copy of the entry in the Exbury, in this case, manorial court roll. So it records that somebody, so-and-so has died, and um, so-and-so now holds that leasehold. And it was usually for three generations. And that meant that one at the top of the list actually was the tenant, farmed the land and paid the rent. And then when he died, the next person down inherited. And there was still a person, the third person was still there. And then 
the new top person can nominate another life. So they were sort of rolling three lives. So if you bought the freehold, you still probably couldn't get hold of it, actually, to work it for, for I don't know, 60, 70 years, because you had to wait for everybody to die off. So it was, um, you know, was it going to be worth it or not? Um, and one of the problems, as I said, when people died, of course, they changed the name of, of, of something so that um, a bargain, which was known as rights, just rights in the book, 1720 was previously Warner's, then before that Smith's, before that Dean's, before that Major's, and before that Eric's. So you can imagine in the book, in the estate book, it changes its name all the time. So they refer to Major's, and you don't know which bit of Major's it's referring to, so you have to look at the date and try and work out you know, who owns it at that particular time. That made it very difficult for me as well as for Mitford. Thank you. And the end result was that what later became known as Leap Farm, and Leap Farm st still exists, um, was made up of all these strips. Can you see the individual fields and bargains and strips? So it wasn't even one contiguous farm. The other um, problem was Queen's College. Um, Queen's College was named after Queen Philippa, who was the wife of Edward III. And she um, secured a small hospital or hospice in Southampton called God's Hill. And the land owned by the hospice was gifted to Queen's College in 1343. And it formed part of their original endowment, uh, the largest part of their endowment. And therefore, the college regarded as inalienable. In other words, they couldn't sell it. Even though it was lots of small strips of land in the middle of open fields in the middle of this whole area. So one of the problems uh, Mitford had was trying to persuade Queen's College that really they, they could sell it. You know, it's only a small strip of land. And it took till 1779 for him to persuade, or his successors to, to persuade them, to accept 19 acres of Clo in, uh, open, uh, closed enclosed land for their 19 strips of open land all scattered all over the place. Um, that's why another reason why it took so long to do this. So if the first problem was finding somebody who's willing to sell to you, the second problem he had was getting what you paid for. Um, nowadays, most when you buy a house, you know, it's a fixed price, usually. Um, and it depends on where it is and location and things like that. Um, but in the 18th century, um, land was valued based on the rental yield. And of course, the rental yield was sort of indirectly linked to the agricultural yield. And that depended on who was farming it and whether they were any good at it. Um, and uh, advisors, um, uh, stewards, were not professional valuers. And they were often rather over-optimistic, particularly if they were acting for the seller. So... Mitford often found that he paid so much for a, a, a selection of fields and it really wasn't worth that. Um, the other, um, so Bartholomew there, tenant of Leap Farm, was a bad husband. Um, so it became worth much less after he was on it for a bit. Oh, uh, sorry, before I move on, the other thing was that land was lost in the ruse and that means that um, when you did a, a measurement, it depended whether you measured the hedgerows or not. Of course, if you were selling, you measured to include the hedgerows and said it was very large. And when you actually came to farm it, you found that actually the, the field was much smaller than you'd expected because there were all these hedgerows, which, of course, later on they took out. The third problem... William had was that he, he wasn't a wealthy man. Um, and in May 1720, he used part of the annuities uh, from his marriage settlement, which were in trust, and um, his father and father-in-law were trustees, to subscribe for shares in the South Sea Company. Everybody's very excited about this. Um, and uh, shortly afterwards, the shares increased in value a lot, and William, being quite a... You know, 
snaggy, careful man, thought that now was time to sell, take his profit and get out. But his father and father-in-law didn't agree. So he had to take them to court to get permission to sell. And he did manage to do that by about August, and um, he got some money out. But a couple of months later, when his father died, the South Sea Company shares were virtually worthless. So his inheritance was very little because it had all been invested in the South Sea Company. Well, as I said, hinted at the beginning, he wasn't going to get money from farming. Um, farming wasn't profitable. It was mostly uh, what they call sheep corn husbandry, which is a mixture of sheep and corn was any, any um, ye uh, wheat, corn, barley, whatever, oats, all of those were described as, as corn. Um, I don't know if you can see these clearly. This is um, some paintings which are in the possession of the Reesdale family, uh, show uh, views of the Exbury estate with some sheep um, and oak trees. And that's the Isle of Wight in the background there. One of the problems um, was that a lot of the terrain was not suitable for sheep. This, this area here is known as the wet meadow for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. And it's not good for um, animals. Um, it has a new, few new forest ponies on it at the moment. And there are also tidal marshes. Now, you, you, you may know that in Scotland they have um, sheep running on salt flats. But, and so the, the, the salt can be good for sheep's feet, I understand. It stops them getting foot rot. But unfortunately here, um, the tidal, the, the walls that were supposed to keep the sea out failed, and so the whole place was flooded frequently, and then, you know, what did you do with your sheep? So that, that, that wasn't great. <clears throat> um, and the land itself, as I said earlier, was basically infertile. I mean, it's just incredibly stony, um, sandy, nothing rich about it. So um, they imported um, dung. And Portsmouth dung was described by Mitford as as good and rich as three loads of our best dung, two to three ratio. And that's because Portsmouth dung was basically human dung, whereas um, their own dung was from the few animals they had and, and you know, compost from the from the plants, so. Mm. And it kept this, this dung came by hoy, that's those small, small uh, ships. It was landed at what is now Gilbury, uh, Exbury Hard. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but I certainly am trying to garden along this coast, but the whole of the coastal area between Lymington and Southampton has its own microclimate. It is in the shadow of the Isle of Wight. I mean, I stand on the coast and I watch the clouds go over and it's raining at Hilltop, at Bewley, and we have no rain at Leap. On the other hand, we do get the storms. You know, we get the gales and the, the hurricanes, which aren't hurricanes, and things like that. Um, so it is very challenging for farming. Um, and the only time it really works is if it's a very wet year. Um, and then being dry is, is, is good. And Exbury, this, this area, suffered very badly in the gales of 1721 and 1750. Um, there were also, also very bad gales in 1704, which completely redesigned the coastland along there. So we think now that gales are you know, new and it's all uh, climate change, but actually um, this estate book records all the gales and the, the problems that they had. So what could Mitford do? Well, he had to find another way of raising some money. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, okay. And you can see from this chart that by 1747, which is the red bars, um, timber and salt production had basically overtaken 
any rental yield from agriculture. So he'd basically given up doing agriculture and, and renting farms and put all his thoughts and money into timber and salt. Um, most um, landowners placed very high value on, on the timber which they had, standing timber they had on their um, estates. And you recall that he paid a lot of money for the timber when he bought the Exbury and Gatewood farms. And one of the longest articles in a contemporary steward's manual dealt with managing woods to best advantage and keeping an account of every single tree. So when the Navy cut down three of his trees in 1718, William challenged them. And he claimed that they were on his land and won two successive court cases. First were the verderers, um, based on a perambulation of the New Forest, then in the Court of Assizes, and um, then he still was challenged in 1793 when the New Forest produced a map, including that land again in their New Forest. And finally, in 1822, he had to pay £533 to get back the land which he claimed he'd always owned. He, William Mitt was, was unusual in not only did he look at the oak trees on his estate, but he also considered growing firs or pine. And this was probably because he was a Baltic timber merchant, so he knew about the importance of timber. And he experimented with different firs and decided that Scots fir was the hardiest. And he tried to calculate the financial returns and concluded that firs uh, gave a better return than oak. Uh, one advantage is he knew where he planted them, so he knew that they were his and didn't belong to the New Forest. And so between um, uh, 1718 and 1753, he planted about oops, sorry, uh, 20,000 trees. So we think we've got to plant some trees, but actually he, he was doing that at the time. And initially he had a seed bed, a nursery bed, and then a final location... And then he decided that actually best to go from the seedbed to the final location. And indeed, that's what we do today. We take some acorns and pine seeds, put them in a pot. And when they get to about this size in the October, we'll plant them out. Still works. So we don't have a nursery bed. Um, and he concluded that um, growing oaks um, to maturity was um, more profitable in the long term, over 70 years, than coppicing every 17 years. And what did he use the timber for? Well, he sold um, some timber to his uncle, who uh, was treasurer of the uh, New River Company in London, and obviously needed some timber to make water pipes, so that was good. And the oak he sold to the, to the Navy. And on the estate, um, the tenants were allowed what was known as plough boot and cart boot, um, in other words, wood for making ploughs and carts and for repairing their, their farmhouses. But he used the, the timber himself um, to build salt pans. And in September 1722, so quite early on, um, he used um, James Gillingham and John Daw to build the salt works. And they were Lim based at Limington, where most of the salt pans were. And I'm sure you, you know about those. Um, and the trenches for make, doing the salt boiling, you can still see at um, low tide today. And I think it's even more effective if you look at this um, aerial shot and you can see how extensive the range of um, salt trenches was at, at, at Exbury. And it cost him um, to do the salt works and to, to build um, cottages for the salt officers who had to uh, charge the duty on the salt cost him £517, which is about £60,000, £70,000 today. So quite a significant investment. So by the third generation, uh, they'd sort of more or less arrived. They'd, they'd achieved what I think was probably their objective to become Mitfords of Exbury rather than agrarian capitalists. Um, in this map... Um, uh, this is Milne, 1791. Uh, it shows, I don't know if you can read it, Exbury House, and then just underneath that, William Mitford Esquire. So 
um, you know, he this is the, the colonel, not the first one. And the colonel uh, was the colonel of the Hampshire militia, and he retired at the age of 22. Um, and was a very well-known um, historian, wrote the history of Greece. And because he was um, Lord of the Manor and landed gentry, he built the whole village of Exbury, which didn't exist where it was. Exbury had originally been on the coast. And, um, and a mansion, now Exbury House. So Exbury, the, the mansion is, is uh, up where, we, where you probably know Exbury is now. And Lower Exbury is what the original Exbury was. And that first picture in the top left is the picture of the old chapel at Exbury, which was actually a chapel of Forley. So it was part of Forley Church and Forley Parish. And then St Catherine's is the new church at Exbury, and that's now part of the Bewley Benefice. And so he'd arrived. He got his Exbury estate, or they got their Exbury estate, and they'd built all these new um, cottages for, their, for the uh, workers and given them all a nice little garden and looked after them very well and um, felt very pleased with himself, no doubt. So, um, thank you for listening. I do hope you'll consider buying this book. It's, uh, all the money goes to charity. £20 is the price, hardback. Um, £15 goes to the New Forest Heritage Centre and £5 to St. Barb. Any questions? We've got a roving mic. So, if you could. I'm sorry. Th thank you, Mama. It was fascinating and I loved all these maps so are you related to Mitford in any way please no um, I'm not related to Mitford at all um, but uh, my uh, great great -grand great grandfather um, bought what was then the Exbury estate from the Mitfords and then my grandfather and two great uncles were killed in the first world war leaving only my grandmother and great aunt and uh, women didn't count for anything so uh, they didn't need a landed estate because they were expected to go off and marry somebody else. Um, and so um, the Exbury was sold to the Rothschilds and we shrank down to what I think is anyway the nicest bit, which is Leap. Anybody else? Chrissy. I was interested to see your coat of, the coat of arms can I ask if those were moles? <laughs> um, I'm afraid I d I'm not a great... Um, I don't really know. Well, I mean, all the sort of quartering and things, but it yes. like they were sort of moles in the background, and I wondered if you knew what... I'm sorry. We'll have to look it up. Yes. yes. Look, there's your moles. <laughs> Top left hand corner. They do look like that, don't they? I mean, no doubt it's got Edwards and then Reevely, and, you know, it, this was um, um, about 1791, I think. So it would be all the people who we've married in. It must have been your accountancy background must have been quite useful to you when you were looking at all those dreadful, um, you know, ledgers and things. Yes, I, I, I'm... I'm I think it, it was useful, and I have to say, I think when I got, came to do my, my PhD, uh, my supervisor said he'd never had somebody submit Excel spreadsheets and pivot tables before, but um, <laughs> I found it very useful for analysing things, because you can actually find out a lot if you know what um, you know, money's been spent on. It tells you a lot. Or who's left money to whom. Any other questions? Thank you very Thank much, you. Emma. That was really fascinating. And I, know, I feel I know an awful lot more when I go and visit Exbury Gardens now. I'll um, go around with renewed interest. Thank you. Thank you.